accidentally went over to the Spanish track. Uh, hola. So we had a very good time over there. And now I get to be with all of you English-speaking people. I happen to be an uh, English speaker myself. If you can't tell, I also happen to be Italian. Now, do you see, the, you see on the screens there, <clears throat> that's not a, a mistake. That's how big my nose is. So uh, being Italian-American, you get a couple of things in your life. You get a giant nose, you get greasy skin, uh, guilt. It's a fun thing to have. However, there are a few things that every Italian should also have. Uh, a good cook. A good cook is very helpful. I usually call them mom or grandma in my family. <laughs> you should have, if at all possible, uh, an Uncle Joe, an uncle, doesn't matter what the name is, but it's, it's a guy who's got a real job. But there's always, you know, 15, 20 extra couches laying around, the things that fell off of a truck. You should always have somebody like that in your life. You should have a lawyer, uh, if possible, present at all times. So it's nice to have a lawyer in the family. And finally, you should try to have a bishop, if at all possible, in your family. Now, as Italians, we had uh, the Bishop of Rome, that is the Pope, for centuries. We had a real nice streak there of, of uh, like 500 unending years of just all guys that kind of looked like me as our Pope. And then we lost the last three elections, but I'm told we're coming back strong in the future. Not happening. Uh, so one of the things about a bishop, you know, the, the, a bishop is a successor to the apostles. And whether you have one in your immediate family or not, we have them in our church family. And since the theme of today is, I will be with you always, of course, the words coming from Jesus. Uh, from Jesus, by the way, those words mean a lot, I'll be with you always. Uh, there are times you don't want to hear those phrases uh, at the beginning of a talk. Hi, I'll be with you always. When you leave tonight, I'll be coming home and talking to you afterwards. You don't want to hear that. Uh, on a first date. I'm going to be with you always. That's creepy. Nobody wants that. So when Jesus says, I'm going to be with you always, he's telling the truth, of course, because he's Jesus. But if you're anything like me, perhaps God forbid, but if you're anything like me, you don't always feel Jesus' presence in your life. You don't always know that he's there. You know theolog uh, theologically that he's there. You might know intellectually that he's there. But you can go through periods of your life where you don't feel Jesus' presence whatsoever. Well, as I look over my life, I realize that's absolutely the case. But there's something Jesus did, thank Jesus, that allows us to feel close to him. And that is, he started a church and he left us a church. And by doing so, we can always be in a relationship with him, even when he feels far away, because we've got the church. Now, does anybody know what church I'm referring to? That's right, the Methodist Church. All right. You're all Methodists, I assume. I, I assume my agent didn't sign me up to the wrong place. So when he started the Catholic Church, Catholic meaning universal, when he started this church, he gave us this concrete way of being with us even when we don't feel that he's with us, which gets me back to my bishop, cousin, and gets me back specifically to the Bishop of Rome. So back in 1999, I was having lunch with my cousin. And you know an Italian lunch starts around 12.30, ends around 7.30 or 8.30, time for dinner again. And we were having lunch, and uh, my cousin, who was working at the Vatican at the time, and, and he's a bit of a name dropper, this cousin of mine. And this can be very off-putting, right? It's, it's not appealing when somebody's a name dropper. I know that. My friend Robert De Niro pointed that out to me. He said, Lino, <laughs> don't be a name dropper. It's just, it's not the future. Well, my cousin, as we were having lunch, he said, oh, I was speaking to the Holy Father yesterday. I said, really? You were speaking to the Holy Father? A guy with my uh, ethnic heritage and bloodline knows the Pope personally. He seemed rather incredulous. Of course I know the Pope, yes. I said, would you like to meet him? Yes, yes I would. I'd like to meet the Pope. And he goes, okay, well, let's see if that can happen. And uh, the next day I got a phone call. 
not from him, but from somebody at the Vatican saying, please report to St. Peter's Square tomorrow morning at 7 a.m. Uh, go to the bronze door. There's some Swiss guards there. You're going to have a private mass with John Paul II in his private chapel. Mm, that name dropping thing kind of paid off for me, right? <laughs> so suddenly at that moment, I felt Jesus' presence in my life. But I felt it in that way that made me go, ooh, I'm not real religious. I felt it in a way perhaps you felt when suddenly you want God in your life or suddenly somebody's looking to you to be Christ in their life and you go, oh, I'm not worthy. I feel very uncomfortable with all of this. And so the first thing I did was I went into a church. Now I'm in Rome, so it doesn't take very long to find one. So you know, I walk two extra feet. I go, well, I'm at a church, good. I walk in church. And I say, okay, well, God, make me worthy. Have you ever done this? Have you ever, have you ever kind of been a mess a lot of your life? And then maybe you're getting married, or maybe you're going in for a surgery, or maybe something's going on, and then you suddenly need God real bad. And then you go, hey, God, I know you're always with me, and I'm not, I'm not always with you, but here's the time to make me real holy. I'm ready. So that's what I did for like an hour. It's called the holy hour. Uh, <laughs> In most of your cases, it's called the holy hour. In my case, it's just called an hour. I spend most of the time just asking myself, instead of God, oh, what should I do when I meet the Pope? What should I say? Should I, uh, should I do some name dropping? Should I ask him to lunch? What should I do when I get a chance to meet the Pope? Hour goes by, I realize I didn't pray very much, but I needed to move on with my day. So the next morning, wake up at 6 a.m., take a shower, I shave, I put on my best suit, otherwise known as my only suit, head down to St. Peter's Square. And as I was approaching this bronze door into these Swiss guards, it occurred to me, well, now nobody told me exactly what to say. And, and what, what do you say? Hello. Uh, as you know, uh, the Pope is expecting me, so I'd like to go break bread, if you will. I, Nobody told me, so, and, and, and so the Swiss guard is standing there. I walk up to him, and I don't even speak Swiss, so I don't know what I'm going to say to the guy. <laughs> and I just said in English, hello, uh, my name is Lino Rulli, and I would, I would like to have mass with the Pope. Looks on the list, he goes, yes. He brings me inside, and there's about 25 other people there. I thought I was going to be by myself, so <laughs> my uh, cousin's not as important as I thought, clearly. So I'm looking around, oh, you, you're, you're worthy enough to have mass with the Pope, and you're worthy, enough. okay. Very big church we've got. So we, we start walking along, and we walk, uh, well, we, we go up an elevator, and we walk down this long, it's called a loggia, there's these frescoes all over, and, and we walk into a room, and it's this large room, and I mean, not a big room like this, but it's this large room, and I see three windows on the side. And I realize that one of those windows is the window that John Paul II goes to looking out onto St. Peter's Square when he, every Sunday, does something called the Angelus. And it wasn't a Sunday, and I'm not the Pope, but it was sure tempting. So uh, I, I really kind of wanted to open it up, tens of thousands of people down there expecting to see the Pope. Watch me get shot by a Swiss guard. So I decided not to do that. We walk through the room, we take another left, and we're in the papal apartment here. I mean, this is his office, his bedroom's down the hall, the papal bathroom's over here, and we go to the left, and it's a little chapel, and holds about 25, 30 people, which is how many we were, and just at the front is the Blessed Sacrament, and in front of the Blessed Sacrament is John Paul II on his knees in prayer. Now, if you're anything like me, again, you know you can't pray, maybe at all, but you know you can't pray if you get distracted. Anything goes on around you, you're distracted, right? You're at church on Sunday, if you're a few minutes early and you're sitting there, you're kneeling or you're sitting and, and somebody walks in, oh, that's it, there goes your prayer, you're completely, oh, what's going on? Who's showing up? You show up, whoa. And what if somebody comes into church a minute or two late? Oh, you're obsessed with this person. No matter how much you are praying, oh, what are they up to? Somebody walks in after the gospel, you're like, this isn't going to count. You might as well come to the next one. <laughs> but you were praying until, you know, this one shows up late. 
You know that you're in a real relationship with God, and you know you know God when 25 people can walk in and nothing changes in your life. John Paul II was this mystic. I don't have to explain that he was holy, I hope, to you. But when you see holiness, you understand it. You, you know what it looks like. You know it's not you. And it's quite beautiful. Uh, it's also kind of discouraging because it's what you want out of your life. So while I was praying next to John Paul II, what I was also doing is praying, God, let me be like that. I, I want that relationship. Coming back to today's theme, Jesus, you are always with me. I know you're with me, but it doesn't feel like you're with me. I feel closer to you in moments like this when I'm actually with your vicar praying next to him, but why does it take moments like this for me to be able to feel close to you? Why can't I just always feel close to you? He didn't answer, so uh, kept praying. We had mass. After mass, the bishop secretary came in and sort of said, okay, everybody, you had your fun, let's go now, and uh, escorted us out. We, all, we would all stand in line, we'd get a chance to meet John Paul II. Well, uh, everybody filed out but me, because I thought I had this cool idea. I would, I would stay in the chapel and I would wait until everybody left, and then it would just be John Paul II and I. And I'd be able to go for the rest of my life to places like this and tell stories that I once prayed in his chapel, just he and I. And as we were together, he had no idea I was there. And wh while we were there, I couldn't wait to tell people. I was like, this is going to be so exciting. I'm going to brag about praying with the Pope forever. Who gets to ever tell this to anybody? This is going to be awesome. And I wish there was a photographer there to capture the moment, but then it wouldn't just be the Pope and I. It'd be the Pope and I and a photographer. It doesn't count. <laughs> After a while, I realized, you know, I better get going before the same guy who wanted to shoot me early might. So I walk out. As I walked out, I realized I never prayed with the Pope. I thought about praying with the Pope and thought about how cool it would be to pray with the Pope. So I get to now be in front of you to say, I once was in a chapel with him, not praying. <laughs> I bet many of you have had the experience as well of not praying with the Pope in his private chapel. Well, the chance comes along and, and John Paul II arrives and, and so I'm back in the line and I'm ready to meet him. And his bishop secretary again says, this is Lino Rulli from the United States. And I go, I would take his hand, and I go to kiss his ring. And <clears throat> as I mentioned, I may have a larger nose. So as I went down, I banged my nose into the ring. <laughs> and I, I went to kiss it, but I couldn't get around. <laughs> so <laughs> yeah, it's, it's a real treat, isn't it? coming from underneath. Uh, so, but, but you know, and I'm like, I'm holding John Paul II's hand. So I look up and uh, that was his reaction. <laughs> Amusement, uh, bewilderment. <laughs> now I gotta say something to him, right? So I, I say, thank you, Holy Father. And he, okay. Not sure what you're thanking me for, but okay. I say, thank you, Holy Father. And at this point, he's probably trying to figure out exactly what the security clearances are of the Vatican of how I got through. <laughs> Clearly an uh, unstable man staring at him. Eventually the Pope uh, lets go of the grip and, <laughs> and moves on. Well, I said thank you, Holy Father, three times. That's the last thing I got to say to him. Uh, and 15 years later was this moment. Really makes this moment because here the is people. the canonization of In John Paul In the Protestant Paul II. world, we call it a tour. And oh, a vacation yeah. or a tour. That's right. Protestants. Probably more interesting than me, actually. I don't know what's going on. <laughs> Telling the story about meeting John Paul I. It's a much better story. So uh, right here, this is the canonization of John Paul II. And again, for me, it's a reminder that Jesus isn't always with us. I mean, Jesus is always with us, but he doesn't always feel like he's with us, right? And there are times in my life where I understand from the Bible that he was like us with all things but sin. The problem is sometimes I feel like I'm only sin. I don't know what other things are going on in my life. Sometimes I just feel like a giant screw up and I go, well, but I'm not the son of God, so how am I to achieve holiness? And 
the church gives us people, and has given us people for 2,000 years, men and women, sinners, like me and you. Not that John Paul II was as big a sinner as me and you, but you get the point. He, the, the God gives us these people. And I think it was a genius move for the church to kind of fast track his canonization because a guy I met, maybe some of you have met him, at least it's one de degree of separation right now, someone with an iPod, someone who enjoyed the theater, someone who was a sinner, who had to go to confession like all of us, is in heaven. The church tells us he is in heaven. It makes heaven more realistic. It makes it more attainable. I go, wait a second, somebody I met, somebody I know, somebody you all seen on TV, everybody knows him, is in heaven. So Jesus is always with us, but he gave us a church and he gives us holy men and women so that we can actually feel his presence and see his presence and understand how it all comes together with someone like St. John Paul II. Uh, now, uh, you know, I'm not always the guy, I was not always the guy, I should say, who was real into church. I was not always the guy who was excited about the bishops of Rome and canonization ceremonies. Born and raised Catholic and uh, went to CCD classes. My mom was the CCD teacher, and she loves to tell the story of uh, one day in her, I'm sure, uh, amazingly, excitingly, uh, exciting class, uh, she was asking us questions. She said, now, who was the first bishop of Rome? And a bunch of dumb kids like myself had no idea, and nobody raised their hand. But she thought, well, my own son is here, so, Lino, can you tell people who was our first pope? And I said, Moses. <laughs> For you Bible scholars out there, I didn't even have, I didn't have the right testament. Uh, she sent me to Catholic school after that. Well, I went to confirmation like everybody else, and I, my confirmation, my confirmation teacher said, when you get confirmed, you're taking on this faith. It's an adult faith now. You get to choose for yourself if you want to practice, not practice. It's up to you. So like most kids, I said, oh, you mean I don't have to go? Yeah. Oh, what a dumb thing that was to say. <laughs> uh, here I, I'm in eighth grade, and you're telling me I don't have to wake up Sunday mornings. Okay. Well, if you insist. Uh, I didn't become anti-Catholic. It wasn't that I was rejecting Jesus. It just, I, it didn't fit into my life because I wanted to sleep in on Sundays. I don't like rules. I kind of want to do whatever I want to do in my life. It's part of being a human being. And when you tell a kid like me that, you go, all right, well, you don't have to be, Lino. I say, well, then I won't be. And uh, I want to show you what I looked like when I was uh, confirmed. This is, this is me. <laughs> What a handsome man, huh? <laughs> I was making a lot of decisions that were really, really good back then. Wasn't going to church anymore. Hair was feathered. <laughs> Got those braces going. Tie clip, still wear a tie clip, that's a little too high. Uh, giant, no, uh, giant rose to take away from the giant nose. You see where I'm going after here. Making a lot of bad decisions back then. Was Jesus with me then? Of course. Is Jesus with us every time we decide we're not with him? Of course. Are his feelings hurt? I think his feelings are hurt a little bit. But when I say, you know what, Jesus, it's not happening right now. When you say, perhaps you don't have to be confirmed, when you say in your life, I'm going to choose me over God right now, when you decide to sin, because let's pretend it's all fake when we uh, say, oh, I didn't mean to sin. When you choose to sin, you're choosing something other than Jesus, but Jesus is still there. Jesus is always there in spite of our decisions and sometimes in spite of ourselves. Jesus is always there. And you know, the other thing is we always say we're too busy. We got too much with work, we got too much with school, we got too much with everything to have any time for Jesus. And we can also use the fact that he's always going to be there to say, I'll check back, with, uh, check back in with you later. I'm going to be busy for a little while. So when I went to high school, I got busy with all the stuff a regular high school kid would be busy with. And I was a four-year letterman. I got the cool letterman's jacket. And you might look at me, and you're trying to figure out what sport I would be a four-year letterman in. <laughs> you assume basketball. Uh, you know, there could be a number of sports. But uh, it wasn't actually a sport. It was theater. Now, uh, there I am, 
just when you thought I couldn't get any uglier. <laughs> there I am in a performance of The Music Man. Good looking kid. I was, I was too busy for Jesus in this photo. I was too busy memorizing my, uh, memorizing my lines and wearing silly hats. We make decisions in our lives if Jesus is important or not. I chose theater for some apparent reason over Jesus. So I spent a lot of time in theater. I spent a lot of time always doing the things I wanted to do. A couple years into high school, I decided I wanted to be a little bit more rebellious than the theater program would allow me to be. And uh, I decided I wanted to be a skateboard punk, which is very difficult to do, especially at a Catholic high school, because they control how long your hair can grow. They control a lot about your life. But a buddy of mine uh, and I decided to do this together. So uh, he's in the front there. And you see me in the back. Now, I got my hair grown out. I'm wearing a late night with David Letterman t-shirt, which isn't exactly rebellious, but it's me. And we spent our time skateboarding. Now, I know you, real, you think to yourself, how silly is it that an actual adult, somebody who was born and raised with the Catholic faith, would prefer to go skateboarding on a Sunday morning than go to church on a Sunday morning? To which I would say to you, what are the decisions you've made in your life that we can look back on and say, I really picked that over Jesus. I really wasted my time with this over Jesus, especially the things that you're bad at. I was the worst skateboarder in the history of skateboarding. There was a hill. Uh, we lived about a mile and a half apart. And basically, it was just one long hill that went down, a hill that went up, and I'd be able to my, be at my buddy Keenan's house. And for the most part, me and my buddies, if we were going over to his place, we'd get on our skateboards and we'd start going down the hill. And, you know, they'd go down at mock speed, and they're having the time of their life, and I was always this scared kid. So about five feet in, I would go like this, and I'd fall off the board, and the uh, board would go straight down without me. It actually seemed to prefer to be on its own. It didn't wobble as much. It was quite good. And it would go off without me, and I would uh, pick myself up. I'd walk by all the neighbors, and they would say, hey, was that your skateboard we saw go by? <laughs> yeah, that was mine. Didn't that happen yesterday? That happened yesterday as well. That's right. He said, see you tomorrow. I said, I'll probably see you tomorrow. That's right. So most of my time was spent either uh, board chasing or board carrying. Not a lot of actual skating going on with this board. This is how I spent my time. Well, Keenan and I, Keenan, uh, Keenan wasn't born and raised in any religious family or anything. He wasn't baptized. And uh, one day we wanted to go out and get some food, but on, uh, we had our skateboards, but we couldn't go to the Mexican restaurant without a car, so my mom drove us. That's rebellious, isn't it? Hey, mom, can you drive us to a Mexican restaurant? So mom and I and Keenan, we go to have some lunch. We're eating lunch. My mom says something, you've heard this phrase, oh, I don't know him from Adam. And uh, my buddy Keenan goes, hey, you Catholics, do you guys believe in Adam and Eve? And I looked around, keeping in mind, I'm the, I'm the uh, Moses first pope guy. <laughs> and I said, sure, I don't know, why not? Sure, mom, do we believe in Adam and Eve? And she said, of course we do. And he said, he goes, no, just so I understand, you guys uh, believe that the world's five, 6,000 years old, you believe that uh, two fully formed human beings, they didn't develop, they just showed up on earth, and then they had children, and then their children had children, and that's how the whole human race came about. And I just sort of sat there quietly eating my chimichanga, going, I don't have any idea what's going on. And uh, I remember the conversation so well because what I knew in my heart was that I knew the Catholic Church had an answer. I knew I didn't, but I knew the Catholic Church had an answer. And one of the beauties of this faith, one of the beauties of this church is no matter how far you kind of get away, no matter how little you actually know, no matter how little you can articulate about the church, Jesus is always there. His church is always there, and you don't have to feel so alone. I mean, so I can, I can tell my buddy Keenan, and I'm like, you know, I don't know if you've noticed, I don't have all the answers in my life. Look at me, I'm a mess. But I can tell you the church has the answers. And I know that the church is there, even when I am not a part of it every week, and I know the church has the answers that you would be looking for. Now, it took him a few years, but uh, Keenan eventually <laughs> looked into this Catholic faith, got baptized into the church as an adult, is now a practicing Catholic. Uh, I would say he's a way better Catholic than me, but 
That's not saying much now, is it? And uh, this is a guy, I go, well, look at all of the changes in your life from asking questions. So Jesus is always with us, but keep in mind, if you just say, hey, Jesus, uh, Adam and Eve, how did that work? You're going to wait a real long time if you just want him to speak from heaven and explain it all to you. Or you can look to the church that he gave us to keep us in a relationship with him and keep us in the faith. And hey, it worked with my buddy Keenan. So uh, now in high school, some other strange things happened to me that made me aware of God's presence even if I wasn't always in relationship with God. My dad, who wouldn't be the most faithful Catholic, let's say, maybe the least faithful, you know, he'd go to church on Christmas and Easter and such, but he was my role model on Sundays. And uh, one day, my dad went to church, and uh, afterwards he said, you know, I, I think God has a plan for my life. And I said, oh, that's good. And my dad was a probation officer at the time, and he said, I think God would like me to be an organ grinder. That's the right reaction, by the way. Uh, do you know what an organ grinder is? A guy, he's got a big crank organ, and he goes like this, and there's a little monkey that dances around, and, and that's how you make a living or are mocked by all of society. Uh, that's what my dad decided God wanted him to do. Okay. Now, the problem was we couldn't afford a monkey. And I remember when he sat, sat me down, he says, Lino, your mom and I have to talk to you. And, you know, I, I didn't know what was going to happen, and, uh, and he explained the story about the organ grinder thing, and he goes, but we can't afford a monkey, let's be honest, we can barely take care of the cats we have. So uh, and I, at that moment I was thinking, is any other father-son conversation happening like this in the world, explaining why we can't have a monkey? And, and he goes, so we can't have a monkey, but we would like you to be the monkey. And then he just got up and left. <laughs> so. Uh, he didn't make me dress like a monkey, I dressed sort of vaguely as a gypsy. And, and I had a cup in my hand and I just asked people for money. What a wonderful childhood this was, right? <laughs> now if you think that's weird, then God asked him to do something different, which is to join the circus. Well, uh, there was this three ring circus, a traveling circus around America called Circus Flora. And the real, it was a real deal with uh, acrobats and animals, and have you ever heard of the flying Walendas? There's this Nick Walenda who just crossed the Grand Canyon. Uh, Nick was in, he and I are the same age, Nick was in the uh, circus as well. They wanted my dad to be the organ grinder, so uh, God told us to drop out of high school and join the circus. That's an actual picture of us in the circus. That's me in the left as a gypsy with my hand up going, what am I doing with my life? And, and that's my dad and that's the organ in the middle. Now they needed me to do something uh, with the circus. So I rode the elephant and uh, the elephant's name was Flora in the circus Flora. So this was my job, uh, was to ride an elephant. And uh, I believe it was just because it was the only thing with a larger snout than I that they, they chose this. Now, when we talk about God's plan in our life, we don't know what exactly God has in store for us, do we? When we ask God, what do you want for me? What, what do you expect of me? He doesn't always answer us with the loud voice that we want. He speaks to us through others. He speaks to us through the silence and the peace we find in trying to follow his will. Uh, I'm gonna crystallize from the a circus to why I'm standing here today in about a minute and a half, and you're going to go, well, that God has a very odd sense of humor. When we, we so we, we really, honest to God, we, I dropped out of high school, we joined the circus, and we traveled around from city to city circusing. I know that's not a word, but that's what we were doing. And uh, along the way, I met a TV reporter who found this very odd to have a father's son in the circus. Years down the road, when I was in college, I decided I wanted to become a TV reporter, TV producer, something like this, and I got in touch with her. She worked at the local NBC station in Minnesota, and I got an internship. A couple years after that, I was eating tacos one day, and I bumped into one of the reporters who I used to work with as an intern. I told him what I was doing with my life, almost nothing, and he said, well, you know, 
maybe I could get you a job. I became a reporter for CBS through a connection he made through some friends of ours. I worked for CBS for a few years. I ended up with my own TV show, got to win a few Emmy Awards, ended up being offered a radio show, a weekly a half hour radio show. I did that for two years, and then nine years ago, Sirius XM Satellite Radio said, would you like a national radio show? I've had a national radio show for almost nine years. It's because of that radio show they sometimes invite me nicely to come and speak at events like this. So I'm standing here because I once rode an elephant in the circus because God told my dad to quit his job and become an organ grinder. Uh-huh. Yeah. So. Jesus is always with us. He doesn't always tell you what's going to happen in your life when you ask him. He doesn't always tell you how things are going to unfold. For the most part, what we do in our relationship with God is ask and try to be patient and wait. What we also should try to do is see what God has in store for us, because I promise it's always going to be 10,000 times more interesting than whatever you have in store for yourself. Whatever plan you think you can come up with, I'm sure God looks and goes, oh, that's cute, sure, whatever. Uh, you notice I created Mars? I got a better plan for you. I, I have some better thoughts than you do on this. And one of the most difficult things of being a human is to let go and to actually let God. One of the most difficult things is to ask the question knowing he's not going to answer you right away. One of the most difficult things is to go to church every week and say, God, I'm trying my best. I'm trying to make my obligation. I'm doing what I can. Can you answer my questions? And to not have it answered. It's tough. It's frustrating. And believe me, when I was not going to church riding cir uh, elephants in a circus, I would never have thought, oh, well, but one day it'll pay off. I'll be giving a talk at a Eucharistic Congress. <laughs> it's not exactly how things work. So let me jump out of the circus. I ended up going back to high school eventually. I ended up going to college. And now college was a time that I actually started getting more interested in Catholicism. I know a lot of people leave the church during that period of time. For me, it was wrestling with how do you have fun and be faithful? And let's be honest, most of my, uh, well, I lost most of the fights when it came to being fun or faithful. This is my 21st birthday. And I, uh, I believe all those beers and shots are mine. And so on my 21st birthday, I was still this guy who, I had a mullet, so the hair thing has always been a problem for me. Uh, in high school, I had that ridiculous feather haircut, now I've got a mullet. Uh, right now, I'm 5'8", 155, there I'm 5'8", 210 pounds. Turns out beer has calories in it. Turns out eating pizza at midnight every night have calories in it as well. That does not look like a guy who's in a real relationship with Jesus Christ. That does not look like a guy who's going to church all the time. But it was at that period of time where I went to confession for the first time since my first confession. And uh, I don't actually remember my first confession, but I assume I went because there's pictures of me from my first communion, and I assume my parents just said, well, let's not take a picture of the kid as he goes in for his first confession. That'll be a little bit awkward. So I remember saying, uh, God, I don't have a great relationship with you, but I, I know that I'm not going to have one without trying to be a part of this church of yours. So I couldn't tell you the words of confession. I couldn't remember anything. College I went to, uh, they had a reconciliation room. It wasn't real confessional. It was a real just room. It was like a rumpus room. It sounded like a fun place to hang out. And uh, there was no line. It's just it's kind of a normal thing, I think, in Catholic churches. So I open up the door. I walk in. It's kind of dimly lit. There's Enya music playing in the background. And I look back, and I see an, uh, a figure in the back of the room. And I just assume that's the priest. So I'm walking towards this man we hope to be a priest. And he says, hello. Way too excited to hear my confession. And I said, hello. And he goes, I'm Steve. You are? I was thinking to myself, confused, <laughs> angry, wondering why you're not Father Steve. And uh, I said, are you a priest? He goes, yeah, trying to convince us both. <laughs> so, 
So as I get up closer, I realize he's sitting on a beanbag. Oh, this is cool. It's a very hip confession. So he's sitting on his beanbag chair. I go and sit next to him. So if I hadn't been to confession since my first one, you can imagine I had racked up quite a few sins. Oh, we go over it all, and some of them he says aren't sins. I'm like, I'm pretty sure they are, Father. I don't want to tell you your business, but uh, pretty sure. Uh, he told me some of his. It was a very weird thing going on. <laughs> and uh, so he absolved me, and I thought, oh, well, maybe I should not do that again. However, I, I turned out to sin again. What are the odds? A guy like me sinned again. And uh, once again, I came to the point in my life where I realized, yes, Jesus is always with me, but when I sin and I say, Jesus, I'm sorry, I know up here that he forgives me, but I don't really know here that he forgives me because I don't hear him say, you're forgiven, I don't hear a thing. Jesus is always with us, but he left the church so that we could feel his presence in very particular ways, like going to confession. So I started going to confession real regularly because I sin real regularly. And I would love to tell you, no, nope, confession, don't do that anymore. That's a thing of the past. But unfortunately, I'll be going pretty much until the day I die. And uh, God, if you're listening, I'd prefer death immediately after confession and my penance. That would be the time to die, right? That's when you die. I mean, that's the future. And, no, and, and people find it fascinating that I talk about confession. And I'm like, well, if you find something amazing in your life, if you know of a good restaurant, don't you tell people about it. Uh, if you know of a great band, I think Foo Fighters are the greatest band on the face of the earth, and I'm in the minority, I know, especially at a Eucharistic Congress. However, <laughs> Foo Fighters are the greatest band on earth. I'll tell anybody. I'll tell you where my favorite restaurants are. I'll tell you the things that I love in my life. How could I not tell you? What a train wreck I would be if I didn't go to confession. I mean, I know I'm a minor derailment now, but the mess I would be without the confessional. I go all the time, and, uh, you know, I know it's scary. People think about uh, what it's like going before. Well, but you're nervous, but you're afraid. I go, yeah, of course. Think about the feeling of leaving. Think about the feeling of being forgiven. And it's the greatest experience uh, on earth and I used to work at a parish, and when I was working at this parish, I had a, a, a schedule, a calendar that would tell me when each priest was going to be hearing confessions. So I would always make sure to go when like the elderly guy was there that was hard of hearing, or <laughs> the guy from a different country, his English wasn't so good. He understood more or less, but let's say he didn't grasp everything. So one day, I decided, well, I gotta go to confession. I look at the thing, I go, ah, good. It's an old guy. So I go in. Bless me, Father, for I have sinned. <laughs> I wish it had been longer since my last confession, but here I am. I tell him my sins. And, uh, you know, the fact of the matter is, I struggle with the same sins over and over again. I wish I could ever get a little bit better. I don't. I struggle with pride. I don't struggle. I lose. I'm horrible. I'm always, and you look at me and you're like, Lena, we've seen parts of your life. What are you proud of? What, what on earth have you boasted about in your life? What, do you think you're a good looking guy or something? I mean, look at my high school picture. Let's say chastity wasn't a problem. but I've got all these sins in my life. And I struggle with sexual sins. I struggle with believing in God. I judge people. I'm judging almost everybody in here. I'm judging everybody. <laughs> oh, my, you know, ugh. I'm starting to think of some of them, and I don't know if I should tell everybody. <laughs> But I have the same sins over and over again, and I don't understand if Jesus is always with me, why I'm not always with him, why I'm not always open to his grace, why I keep committing these sins. So I go in the confessional, same old sins. Uh, for these and all the sins of my past, I'm sorry. And the voice on the other side was my pastor. It wasn't the old guy, it was the guy, like as soon as he says, well, I'm like, oh no, I know you. <laughs> and that means I know you know me. Yeah, let's say when we had our little, uh, you know, we had a meeting later that afternoon. I was very quiet in case he didn't remember my voice. So I'll be honest, I just started changing my voice. When I go to confession now, forget about it. It's enough. Uh, 
Uh, now I've got this weird, it's like a Muppet in Silence of the Lambs. I don't know what it is. It's, it's this weird, it's like, bless me, Father, for I have sinned. I don't know what that is. And I'm sure the priest on the other side is going, what kind of an animal's on the other side here? This is when I feel Jesus' presence. When the priest, not because he's some holy guy, not because he's got magical powers, but because he's a Catholic priest in our church, he's able to say, through the ministry of the church, may God grant you pardon and peace, and I absolve you of your sins in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. By the way, you notice I know his lines and my lines? Yeah. <laughs> That's what happens when you go a lot. I mean, my theater background helps, but I'm like, Father, I think you're supposed to say this next. Well. I'm a sinner, and you're a sinner, and no matter what stupid things we do in our life, God is there, and God is always with us, and he gave us this church so that we could always feel his presence, and he gave us vicars of Christ, of himself, so that we always had a representative there. And I began this talk by talking about John Paul II, and I'll end it by talking about Pope Francis. Well, a couple years ago, as you may have heard, Pope Benedict XVI resigned, and there was this real weird thing going on in the church because popes don't quit, they die. And not that we wanted him to die, but we didn't know what to make of the whole thing. And, and you know, I was on the radio every day, and when we flew to Rome, uh, I was on CNN every night, and uh, Piers Morgan had me as his Rome correspondent. You guys remember Piers Morgan? Remember that guy? Yeah. I think I'm the reason he's not on the air anymore, but I was his Rome correspondent. And all the questions were always, you know, it was never, what does God have in mind? It was, what do these guys have in mind? What does the church need here on earth? Not, what does the church need? And with all the questions that were always posed, you know, certain names would come up and, and well, Lino, this would be a British accent. Lino, who do you think, uh, that's not a British accent at all, <laughs> Scottish. Uh, Lino, who do you think will be the next pope? Well, Pierce, <laughs> sound more like Sean Connery, but whatever. Uh, I, I always had one guy in mind that I said, well, it wouldn't be the worst thing in the world if my boss, Cardinal Timothy Dolan, became pope. Uh, because, oh no, you can have, yeah, you can applaud, sure. I, uh, I, I only wanted it because you think my cousin had pull. Now I'd be able to have some pull. <laughs> and we were always talking about things, but you know, what I never really got to say a whole lot about on TV, and it's my own fault, I'm not uh, blaming anybody, is it was, we never talked enough about who is the Holy Spirit guiding these men to pick? Who does Jesus want as the next leader of our church? And while I, we had a bunch of names all set to go, and Dolan and O'Malley or Scola from Venice, we had all these names picked out. So I was live on the air with our friend Father Dave Dwyer of the Busted Halo Show, who spoke here last year. We were live on the air when the name Jorge Mario Bergoglio was announced, and this was our reaction. <laughs> who? Who did Jesus pick? Who did Jesus pick? We, 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 we don't know who this is. We had done no research at all. Well, uh, it certainly tells you that Jesus is always with us, and he's always going to be protecting his church and leading his church when a guy who most of you probably never heard of, certainly I had not been prepared for, we got this name. And this has been some amazing two plus years of him as our Pope. But then I got a chance to meet him. and. I didn't want to make the same mistakes I made with John Paul II, you know. I prepped this time. I knew exactly what I was going to say to Pope Francis. And I was going to say, Holy Father, I want to do God's will in my life. Can we pray together? And I was going to say it in Italian. I speak Italian. I practiced it over and over and over again. Now, it wasn't at a mass. It was at a Wednesday general audience. So there's people all around, so I had to be very focused and very ready. So the chance comes. The Vicar of Christ walks up to me. Look at me, look at me. I got a nice suit on, I got my hand out, I'm ready to go, I'm ready to run for office. I, do I have your vote? <laughs> so I look at him, and I look him in the eyes, and I say, <laughs> as I'm now used to, popes have a tendency to be patient for a few seconds. <laughs> and then say, security, and uh, 
So we walked away, and there's a great picture of me going, ah, afterwards. And I, honest to God, there's me going, can we pray together? Well, he didn't hear me, nothing happened. You know, I'm a gigantic sinner. And wherever I go, there I am. The same flaws, the same mistakes, the same tendency to selfishness, the same tendency to sin. And yet wherever I go and you go, that same Jesus is always with us, and that church he gave us is always with us. So I'm glad you were with me. I appreciate your time. Take care and God bless. Bye-bye. Oh.